Uh, it is my pleasure to re-welcome back to Penn Gus Hurwitz. Uh, Gus was actually the first fellow in CTIC who has gone on to do greater things as a uh, professor at the Nebraska College of Law, but in addition where he leads the hookups, helps lead, co-leads the Cyberspace Telecom Center there. He's doing work on, uh, this is an area which I think is wonderful, is about public-private partnerships. In the worlds I live in, this is sprinkled like fairy dust. They say, oh, we'll just make it a public-private partnership, and that's supposed to be some magic formula that makes everything work better. <laughs> Gus is going to help us understand whether that's the case, and if so, when, how, and why. Okay, uh, thank you, Christopher. It's always um, great to be back. I will emphasize uh, this is a work in progress. Um, uh, I've been thinking about uh, public-private partnerships and what they actually mean for exactly the reason that Christopher mentioned. Uh, they're kind of sprinkled like magic fairy dust. Uh, people talk about them uh, a whole lot. What they actually are is a pretty nebulous uh, uh, concept. Um, uh, a couple of uh, 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 framing uh, remarks. First, congratulations on this event. Um, just looking, uh, listening uh, to um, uh, uh, Peter's paper and reading through some of the next papers and this one, they're in many ways in unexpected dialogue with each other, which um, I, I know there was planning that went into the event to make that happen, but it's amazing how often that doesn't actually happen when you try and put together an event like this. And uh, 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 listening to Shane's paper, um, uh, I was thinking throughout, was the internet a public-private partnership? How was it a public-private partnership? Um, and in fact, I will ramble a lot over the next 20 minutes or so about AT&T and telecommunications regulation during the 20th century um, and uh, the role of AT&T I won't talk about, but uh, in the uh, development of the internet, uh, what was their role uh, in this? Um, also, the, the goal, the purpose of this paper isn't to put forth a new theory of regulation or to explain what public-private partnerships are or put forth a theory of them. Um, rather, it's to learn what we can from the recent uh, experiences with and experiments with public-private partnerships and how these ideas can affect uh, our understanding of uh, regulation. So uh, uh, to make a bad uh, both behavioral joke and antitrust joke, I think of this paper as a bit of a nudge, hopefully to uh, make a small but significant and non-transitory change in how we think about regulation, not to fundamentally alter it, but to make a small but hopefully important uh, uh, contribution. Okay, so the, the project, um, the research question, not necessarily a, a narrow one, but what lessons are there for regulation uh, from our experience with public-private partnerships over the last 30 or 40 years? Yes, I will take a moment uh, uh, in a bit to talk about what public-private partnerships are. Um, the motivation, as uh, I've said, is that these things have become increasingly uh, uh, popular um, over the last several years. We see them talked about increasingly. I live in the telecom and tech space. In the telecom space, uh, we see a lot of discussion about them, but we see them across the board, um, all over the place uh, lately. But my real motivation is actually completely different. My real motivation is to think about how we regulate the tech sector and the tech industry and the relationship of the tech sector and tech industry with regulators. Because, to be frank, it sucks. It's a bad relationship. Um, it's a very acrimonious relationship, it's a very, very adversarial relationship on the regulatory side, and it's a very adversarial and also, I think, transactional relationship um, on the industry side. Um, we've seen this over uh, uh, the last 20 years as we've uh, uh, watched, uh, this is echoing uh, uh, some of uh, the comments uh, before, um, the origins of the internet, the modern commercial internet in the 1980s into the 1990s, they were messy, they were non-deliberate, they didn't take into account uh, a lot of security and privacy concerns, it, they incurred a lot of technical debts that we're now having to pay off. Um, and uh, the debt collectors are the regulators, and the regulators are coming to the Facebooks of the world uh, with a club in hand, saying, shape up or we're going to beat you. Uh, and uh, when you talk to folks at the FTC, especially over the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, um, they are strategic. They are thinking, they're talking 
how can we inflict pain to affect the conduct of the industry? Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That's how the law works frequently. Um, but it is definitely an <coughs> adversarial approach. On the other side of that relationship, the modern tech industry, they view this as a transactional relationship. They view the regulators as obstacles. They view the role of the law or the role of lawyers as transaction cost engineers at best. It's make the regulators go away. And if you can't, we'll just change our technology. And if we can't do that, well, you know, the, the regulators can't really do anything to this technology because it's magic pixie dust. Um, so we don't care about the regulators. And of course, what's the regulatory response to that sort of relationship? We're going to come down on you harder. So this is a very uh, uh, um, adversarial sort of environment that we're in right now. And I'm curious, just without knowing anything about what public-private partnerships are, is the partnership model a better, a different approach to managing this relationship? Um, where does it work? Where uh, does it not work? And why? Uh, so that, that's really what got me interested in thinking about this. OK, so uh, a framing narrative. I said I was going to ramble about AT&T. Uh, um, I like to use uh, this history uh, I, uh, in my telecommunications <coughs> class. I like to use the telecommunications class and the, the history of AT&T really is an exploration of different approaches to regulation. Um, and the history of AT&T over the 20th century from a pedagogical perspective is fascinating because it's oscillating back and forth between antitrust and market-based approaches to regulation and then prescriptive command and control approaches to regulation. It's generally, we uh, talk about it as starting with the 1913 Kingsbury Commitment, which is a settlement in a major antitrust investigation. Um, prior to that, AT&T uh, uh, wasn't really regulated. The telecom sector wasn't uh, really regulated. So we have this antitrust uh, 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 enforcement action that leads to the settlement. The industry agrees to change uh, its practices. Over the next 30 or so years, we have much more command and control regulation. The development of uh, uh, the FCC, which was a command and control regulator for uh, the telecom industry, we allowed uh, AT&T to consolidate, to buy up uh, the uh, local, most of the local carriers, uh, really implement uh, Theodore Bell, AT&T's uh, uh, president, um, his vision of one network um, as the efficient way to run the network. Um, and 19 went through the uh, 1940s. That was how the telephone system operated. We saw antitrust concerns starting to creep up, which led to a 1956 major uh, uh, antitrust uh, settlement again. So we oscillated back to, hey, the regulatory <coughs> approach is leading to problems. We don't think the regulators are on top of this. Let's antitrust uh, uh, the company again. Uh, this led uh, to the computer inquiries in the uh, 1960s through 1980s, <coughs> where we were trying to take a regulatory approach to these emerging technologies, these computers that we're developing. And of course, that led to the breakup of AT&T, huge antitrust action, 1970s into the 1980s, which leads back to the uh, 96 Telecom Act, which was a, a real pivotal turning point where we said, um, you know, this back and forth Let's try something different. Let's try to identify what parts of the market can be competitive and use regulation to introduce competition. So a, a, a different approach. But it's this back and forth uh, that we uh, see in the history of AT&T. Um, and I, I love talking about that. I love teaching that. But the reality for anyone who knows the history of AT&T is a whole lot different. Um, it was much more akin to a partnership with the federal government uh, with uh, regulators, with academia, with uh, the uh, defense uh, uh, complex. Um, AT&T played a, uh, a instrumental role. Uh, we we uh, just heard Shane talking about the development of uh, the internet, DARPA. This is defense funded. What, what wires was DARPA using to build these networks? AT&T's uh, uh, wires. It was the invention of the transistor by Bell Labs. Uh, that led to digital communication, which was the uh, uh, physical layer on which packets, uh, uh, packet infrastructures were built. Um, the back and forth between senior researchers and executives um, uh, in the industry were seamless. AT&T uh, senior uh, leadership and uh, researchers were in and out of government and academia very fluidly. Um, so it was a much more partnership-like story. Why? What was AT&T's motivation? I don't know. I don't um, uh, 
war er, uh, the war years, post-war era, public spiritedness, public mindedness. They, they recognized that what they were doing was important. Perhaps pure public choice story, they recognize capture the regulators. If you are a regulator, uh, uh, this is the easy way to do it. Uh, perhaps it was a sense of uh, noblesse oblige. Um, uh, we are the, the big wealthy monopoly. We recognize that if we don't give back and keep the government and uh, uh, the, the citizens somewhat happy, they're going to turn on us. Um, I think that there's some of that going on in the story as well. I'm not sure that entirely matters, but there was a two-way relationship. Two-way relationship. I'll come back to those words um, going on uh, uh, with the regulation of AT&T. Um, so, reframing this slightly, uh, in, in the paper I spend far too many words. Uh, I, I didn't get the memo that it only uh, uh, should be an 8,000 word paper. Uh, it's, the, it's not longer than that by much. Uh, it, it's uh, 10,000 words, but uh, it's not done. Um, so, uh, maybe the next version I can just cut every other word. Um, uh, so, uh, in the traditional legal sense, the history of AT&T I, I talk about as antitrust, market-based, ex-post regulation versus command and control, ex-ante uh, 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 regulation. Um, in the, uh, a different way that we can structure that is adjudication versus rulemaking. This doesn't quite map 100% uh, uh, on, but this is the standard legal framework uh, for how we think about regulation. We've got two basic modalities for what regulators do. Enforcement actions, adjudication, and rulemaking. Uh, this is baked into how we think as lawyers about regulation. There are constitutional reasons for this. Uh, we uh, have due process requirements. There are legal history, common law uh, 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 reasons that we are comfortable with the uh, adjudication-based uh, approach uh, to uh, regulation. And for the last half century, uh, uh, now more than half century, uh, this is baked into the DNA of the administrative state through the Administrative uh, Procedures Act. Um, take your uh, ad law class and you've got your basic informal, uh, formal adjudication rulemaking matrix. Everything that an agency does falls into the category of adjudication or rulemaking as a legal matter. Um, this uh, uh, creates a mindset, especially for regulators, of Adversari adversarial levy. I'm not going to say that word again. Uh, it's an adversary relationship. And I'm the regulator. I've got two tools. I'm going to haul you into court or before a tribunal and say what you did was wrong and we're going to punish you, or I'm going to issue rules that are going to constrain your conduct. Basically, these are tools by which uh, uh, the public interest can be imposed upon and can, uh, can constrain private interests. It's baked into the DNA of what regulators do. Um, that's not good. But in the American tradition, uh, that, that is what it is. Uh, it frames a lot of uh, how we think about regulation. Um, I'll touch on, I'll, I'll just frame up uh, right now uh, as well, all the public choice uh, and political economy uh, issues. One of the cool things about uh, um, the, the uh, discussion uh, uh, in all these papers, we don't shy away from public choice issues, political economy issues. That's a breath of fresh air, so we all recognize that they're there. Okay. What the heck is a public-private partnership? I don't know. It's uh, fascinating in the literature. Uh, the literature doesn't know either. It's kind of a, I know it when I see it. Uh, sort of thing. There are lots of examples. I'll talk about uh, a couple. The history of public-private partnerships, you can find examples throughout history of things people label uh, public-private partnerships, but the, the modern history of public-private partnerships uh, uh, goes to complex government procurement contracts. Uh, in the uh, 1960s, uh, we uh, uh, were engaged in more and more government projects, infrastructure projects, development projects, uh, and they were complex, and uh, the government wasn't particularly efficient at them, so uh, we started exploring with how can we, as the government, reach out and partner with industry to make these things happen uh, more efficiently. Um, and the number one motivation on the government side in the literature people talk about for uh, these sort of partnerships is a myth. I'll just label it a myth. 
um, that if you partner with private industry, they can do stuff more efficiently or at lower cost, or they've got better management skills uh, and what's not. Uh, the history over the last um, uh, couple of decades has really panned out uh, to show if you're thinking about a public-private partnership as a way to save money, you're doing it wrong. You're probably going to fail. It's probably going to end up costing you more. There are values to public-private partnerships, but if it's just these people know how to manage people better, your problem as a government entity is that you don't manage people well. You should learn how to manage projects better and internalize uh, uh, this project instead of trying to outsource it because you probably can't manage the people you're outsourcing it to, so they're going to fleece you. Uh, that's uh, kind of the reality for how a lot of these projects have played out. I, I should say, uh, since the 1990s, uh, there's been a massive boom in public-private partnerships. There have been uh, thousands of them around the world, billions of dollars invested in them. Uh, following the uh, financial crisis, um, there, a lot of them collapsed, um, and there's been a lot more skepticism of them. They're still very popular, but uh, the uh, outright enthusiasm for them uh, in the 1990s has waned a great deal because folks have run the first round of the experiment and realized, oh, just outsourcing our inability to manage doesn't improve uh, uh, the management outcomes. Um, two standard, uh, the, the biggest uh, place where we see public-private partnerships is infrastructure projects. Um, and one of the approaches that's commonly used for public uh, justifications or purposes of a, a P3 uh, is basically financing. Uh, the government needs to do some big capital project. They don't have the resources for it. They don't have the funding for it. Instead of taking a, uh, doing a bond issue to pay for it, what they do is they bring in a, a company with money and say, hey, you build out this toll road. You update uh, this toll road to newer technology, put all the easy pass stuff on there, you front the costs, and we'll let you manage it for the next 100 years and take all the profit, or take a 50% share of the profit. So you front all the costs for it, we're not on the hook for uh, uh, any risk as a government. Governments love not being on the hook uh, for uh, that sort of money, um, and you get all the profits for it. Um, from the financing perspective, that's how a lot of the government actors get into these. Um, the economic theory uh, behind them, uh, Oliver Hart was the first uh, uh, person to really look at this. He views them as a, a form of uh, incomplete uh, contracting in a multi-stage game. Um, the idea here uh, uh, is really hey, you assume the risk in building out this project. Uh, so the government says to the private contractor, you assume the risk in building out this private uh, 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 project, this public project, because you're going to be operating it. So instead of saying, we're going to just hire you in a normal procurement contract to uh, uh, construct the toll road for us, and then we're going to manage it, or we're going to bring someone else in to manage it, and then you're going to cut corners because you don't need to live with the consequence of your poor construction skills. You're going to build it and then manage it. So at stage one, you have an incentive to design well to make it easy to manage at stage two. Internalizing uh, 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 those uh, risks across uh, time periods. Um, giving uh, uh, where there are uh, uh, governance questions embedded in uh, time period one that will affect operation at time period two, instead of trying to micromanage them and trying to use a complete contract to assess uh, how the uh, project should be designed and completed, um, we give uh, uh, incentives to the designer and uh, the construction party to design it well without the need for that oversight. Um, so that's one of the standard uh, examples. Another example, very different context, is cybersecurity. In uh, the cybersecurity context, we have uh, all sorts of information sharing entities at the federal level, the state level, the industry level, which are frequently coordinated by the government, using the government's ability to credibly convene uh, people uh, and parties to uh, shield parties from antitrust concerns and the like to be a go-to entity whose 
responsible when you have a state, a nation state engaging in adverse uh, cyber activity? Is this something for private industry? No, the government should be involved here. So there's a credibility issue, there's a comparative advantage, there's an expertise issue uh, that makes sense. So this is one of the uh, standard examples where public-private partnerships have worked really well. It's about bringing a credibility and expertise from multiple parties uh, to the table where some of those parties are uh, uh, private actors, some of them are public actors. And I, I'd, I'd ask, thinking back to uh, uh, the development of the internet, um, uh, again to reference prior papers um, uh, across the silos, uh, is that a role that the government was playing in the design of the internet? Is that part of the reason that it worked uh, well? Was the government bringing together private expertise that couldn't have coordinated uh, on its own, and was that part of the uh, uh, recipe to the success? I don't know, just asking. Um, okay, I already said that we have a, a unsmiley face, sad face, I guess that's what we call them, uh, by the efficiency and cost savings justification. Um, other explanations, uh, I mentioned the incomplete contracts, agency costs, uh, comparative advantage, advantage um, I've mentioned. Really, what we start to see, um, and the literature in public-private partnerships over the last 10 years or so, I think, has been increasingly taking this trend, is the value of a public-private partnership is about the relationship. Hart's model focuses on a two-stage uh, game. Uh, it focuses on uh, uh, the development and operation stages of implementation of a, a project. Um, in those two-stage games, if the uh, uh, contractor can recognize that, hey, at some point the contract is going to end, you've got backwards induction, the uh, a success rate starts to uh, uh, break down. If you have an ongoing relationship, however, uh, that's where uh, these agreements tend to produce the best results. Um, another uh, interesting strand in the um, literature on public-private partnerships, uh, oh, you cannot see the little green dot that uh, bullet point uh, second from the bottom, government contractors have been reinventing regulation. This is actually a really fascinating uh, 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 set of issues. Basically, they've got these ongoing relationships uh, where there are governance rights in the incomplete contract model held by the, uh, con the private uh, party. How does the government oversee that? They've been coming up with, they've been reinventing all the same issues uh, that uh, government regulators, federal regulators, fought with in the 20th century. Uh, I, I always go back to thinking about at and uh, You see a lot of the same stuff there. Um, okay, so what am I doing with this? I appreciate feedback. I appreciate help. I have initial thoughts. Uh, uh, I've got some initial things, ideas I'm playing with, but um, uh, I expect or I hope that uh, you all will push me to develop these uh, more robustly and give me some more uh, things to think about here. Um, both regulation and public-private partnerships are about using tools, what tools we have, to align public incentives with private incentives, to uh, 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 use uh, public power to control uh, private interests uh, in ways that benefit the public ultimately. Uh, the critical difference uh, between them, or one critical difference between them, uh, uh, is the origin of the activity. Um, Public-private partnerships are initiated generally by public actors, by regulators. Governments say, we want to do X, Y, or Z. We have an infrastructure that's failing, we need to upgrade it. We have some project that we want to implement, uh, we need to bring in outside resources to do it. So it's uh, directed by uh, uh, public interests. Regulation is generally responsive uh, to um, private interests. So companies start doing X, Y, or Z, people say, oh, this is problematic, or competitors say, oh, this is problematic, um, and the government gets involved after uh, the fact uh, to start trying to constrain or control uh, the private interests. I don't know if this is a fundamental obstacle for trying to learn uh, lessons uh, from the partnership side and translate them to uh, the more traditional regulatory side. Um, certainly, it is an important difference. Uh, Public-private partnerships work best 
when the purpose is relational. When the goal is to develop a relationship with uh, the private interests, and my sense is that this works as well in the regulatory uh, context. Um, this is the story of AT and T. This is the story of a lot of historic uh, uh, partner uh, uh, regulatory settings where there is a lot of back and forth, where the regulators and the regulatees, the regulated parties, have an ongoing relationship, and we're able to check uh, uh, the um, political economy concerns there. Um, and I, I actually have a. a question that uh, I'm starting to delve into more about whether the partnership model um, is a way to check some of these public choice concerns. Um, I, I have to say, you're, you're just sitting here looking at me, I'm thinking, oh man, this... <laughs> I'm working my chops. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it, it's uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, to <laughs> um, uh, so the public-private partnership model is, uh, it generally separates oversight of implementation and oversight of design of the regulatory model. Uh, is separating that uh, uh, a way to check some of the uh, public choice concerns? If you look at the FCC, for instance, there, that both of those uh, aspects are integrated. When you've got parties coming before the FCC, the FCC is in charge of policing uh, itself in that relationship. Um, I fully believe that the current adversarial setting uh, is uh, incredibly toxic. I think uh, uh, it's a, uh, we're in a bad place right now in the tech regulation discussion, uh, and it's largely because uh, the regulators approach the industry as policemen with a, uh, a nightstick, and the uh, tech industry approaches uh, the regulators as narcs to be avoided. Um, and the partnership approach uh, would be healthier. And importantly, uh, and th this is one of the uh, main ideas I'm playing with, um, I think it's up to the regulatory side to fix this relationship, to change that adversarial role. So this is a lesson, uh, uh, the public-private partnerships, they are government-initiated. If these lessons are going to be incorporated, I think that that incorporation needs to be uh, uh, initiated uh, by the government as well. Okay, just a couple of next steps uh, where this is going. Um, I, I know I'm just about at time. Um, I've been delving into uh, uh, some of the early, the 1980s ACUS reports on public-private partnerships and also some of the uh, more recent literature, but the 1980s reports are awesome because reading through them, uh, I... I just keep hearing Ostrom, Elnor Ostrom, over and over and over, and governing the commons over and over and over. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, ACUS was saying, in order to have a successful public-private partnership, it's torn straight out of uh, Elnor Ostrom. And actually, the direction I'm increasingly going with this project is, uh, in order for P3s to work, they need to be more uh, 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 common ownership, uh, not common ownership, but, but uh, uh, Ostrom governance-like and same thing from uh, the um, regulatory perspective, uh, the regulatory side. Um, so that's uh, uh, just where I will end because the piece of paper just went up. But I increasingly I'm wondering, am I just reinventing Ostrom? And if so, I think I'm okay with that. <laughs> David Zarin, who needs no introduction, distinguished professor from work. Okay, well, uh, thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading Gus's provocative paper, and, uh, you know, um, three things I liked about it was, first of all, it takes the public-private partnership and it moves it beyond the question of infrastructure provision, which is where I think a lot of the talk about what um, public-private partnerships can do and should do has come down to, especially in the current administration, which is always about to call for infrastructure week uh, and never seems to actually... Uh, happen, but uh, Infrastructure Week is, uh, you know, um, probably going to be characterized, if it ever does happen, as something involving public-private partnership, where the government provides tax financing and private parties build roads and airports and, uh, you know, Americans go back to work or whatever. 
Okay, so that's good. Uh, Gus says that's not the only thing that you can think about when you think about public-private partnerships. You can also think about natural monopolies like AT&T. Um, and uh, I appreciated that sort of different and new vision about what a public-private partnership can be about. And then finally, I have a lot of time for um, the sort of we feeling that Gus thinks is an important component of making the private sector and the government work together. Uh, he's got this idea that really interests need to be aligned and that AT&T's maybe noblesse oblige, although that's not always thought to be a term that is, you know, a good thing, was actually a good thing when it came to providing, a, you know, useful service that, uh, you know, millions of Americans enjoyed uh, from a respected company that uh, also uh, did the government's bidding in some important way. Um, and, you know, I think one of the takeaways from his paper is that maybe we need to get back from, to that kind of uh, sort of we feeling or relationship in other regulatory contexts. And it's just interesting to think about how that could work. Okay, so what I want to talk about as I riff on this paper um, over 15 minutes, is that right? Uh, is, okay, first of all, I want to talk about, um, you know, four visions of what public private partnerships are. Um, and one vision is that they're sort of an example of cash-strapped governance, and Gus talks a little bit about that. And then secondly, uh, and he spends a lot of time talking about this, there's this idea that uh, public-private partnerships are, are sort of incomplete contracts. And one good way to think about what they do is to think about them as sort of incomplete contracts between the private sector and the government. Um, a, a third way, which I think Gus dismisses, and appropriately so, is to think about public-private partnerships as requirements contracts. Um, and I'll riff a little bit on that. And then finally, um, those of you who know me, and, and most of you don't, so uh, maybe this will be new to you, um, uh, but those of you who know me won't be surprised to hear that I think about public-private partnerships in the context of financial regulation, specifically the regulation between banks and the government. Um, and I think that's an enduring, long-standing, and age-old example of public-private partnerships, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think uh, that's the case. Okay, so first... PPPs, what are they for different visions? Second, what do we make of AT&T? Um, and I think Gus suggests that AT&T is sui generis. And what I'm going to suggest is that no, actually, there are other models, uh, age-old models, that uh, look a lot like AT&T in other uh, governmental contexts. Third, I want to contrast public-private partnerships with command and control regulation. And one of my takeaways uh, this will sound sort of lefty, but um, is, uh, you know, maybe command and control regulation isn't an example of sort of adversarial governance, but an example of actually effective um, uh, private sector-led economic development, which is then checked by regulators responding to what the private sector does. And I suggest that that's going to be different than the model of sort of AT&T-style um, government programs using the private sector. And then finally, the fourth thing I want to do is complain about Gus's cybersecurity example. So, um, so that's the plan. Um, and uh, uh, without any further ado, um, first, uh, public-private partnerships. Okay. So um, uh, one of the classic ways that people think about public-private partnerships is that it's sort of cash-strapped governance. Uh, the idea is the government wants to do a thing, build a thing, uh, renovate an airport, uh, put up a new road, and it doesn't have the money for it on its own, and it doesn't want to go raise taxes or do a bond issue. So why not um, have the um, uh, why not charter some private sector body to do the thing that the government can't afford to do, uh, and pay them off in the future um, by letting them run the thing and extract rents and tolls and management fees for doing so. Okay, that's fine as far as it goes, but um, I think one of the interesting things about Gus's paper is he says, well, there's more to thinking about public-private partnerships than just a way to raise money to do various government programs, and that is to think of it as a sort of incomplete going-forward contract. So uh, I think there is something to this, um, that uh, uh, public-private partnership suggests that there's some sort of ongoing relationship between uh, the government and the private sector body that's doing the government service. Uh, and in the context of infrastructure, which is often where public-private partnerships are talked about, it looks to me a little bit, when you think about this sort of incomplete contracting lens, that what you're looking at is some version of project finance that doesn't work the way that project finance should. 
So project finance is, you know, all about, you know, um, a big upfront investment in something which is going to pay off um, uh, over time. Um, and the risks imposed by project finance is you have to put all this money together to build the gas plant or put up the dam or whatever it is you're trying to finance. Um, and that the benefits will come uh, slowly and incrementally over the future in the stream of tolls and rents that the project that you spend all that upfront money on pays off. Okay, so when the uh, private sector is doing project finance, one of, the way, one of the things they do is they make it non-recourse, right? So the way they limit the risk uh, is that you can't go after the investors in this project. And instead, you put together a company, uh, and if the company goes bust, um, uh, then uh, uh, nobody has recourse to the people who finance the project. And so those, that way, those guys know that their downside risk of making this big upfront investment is limited. Okay, but one problem with project finance is that it doesn't really make sense. So that makes sense as a, you know, when we're building the road or building the airport. Uh, it all makes sense. Uh, but one problem in the government context, in the public-private partnership context, is that project finance is non-recourse and public-private partnerships are almost by design and necessity recourse loans where you, uh, uh, the government is on the hook if the project goes bad. So uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, this comes up often uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, public-private partnerships for infrastructure. Uh, you know, what happens if um, the deal is too good for the government and the management company can't make money off the toll road? Well, then the company goes bust and the government takes over the project and they're on the hook uh, for everything that went wrong about the deal. Um, by the same token, if the government, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, imposes... Uh, uh, costs on the management company so that it can't make money off the thing, then once again, the management company will give the project back to the government. And so one of the problems with public-private partnerships is there's often been this sort of refinancing that has to happen halfway through the partnership where the government says, we thought we were building a toll road for $200 million and you were going to cover the rest, and it turns out we need to give you another $200 million because you can't make money on this project in the way you thought. So uh, an incomplete contract that looks a little bit like project finance, but doesn't work like project finance because what happens is there is always recourse to the government in a public-private partnership. So there you go. That's a riff on incomplete contracting. And one of the ways in which incomplete contracting is particularly different in public-private partnerships because the incomplete contract usually has, uh, you know, um, uh, the government's the fall guy at the end of the project, at, at the incomplete contract, and that really is hard to change. Okay. Uh, what about requirements contracting? Um, so uh, I think Gus dismisses this um, as not what public-private partnerships are all about, and I sort of agree with him, and so I'm just going to briefly riff on this here, um, uh, because you probably do too. Um, but, you know, one question is, you know, what isn't, isn't what north of government, government Grumman gives the Defense Department. Is that a public-private partnership? And just sort of, you know, one way of thinking about it is not really. I mean, the government may have some sort of ongoing interest in keeping um, uh, defense contractors alive and around for future projects. Um, but uh, what happens is, you know, uh, in requirements contracting, the government uh, contracts for the thing, and then the private sector delivers the thing, and then the thing becomes the government's. And that's different than public-private partnerships, which, uh, as Gus says, and I agree, sort of involve this sort of ongoing relationship. So um, you don't have to think of these guys uh, or every contract where the private sector provides something to the government as a public-private partnership. Instead, I think you can think of public-private partnerships as uh, involving an ongoing relationship where the toll road gets built and the government uh, remains on the hook if the toll road doesn't make money. And, you know, after 30 years, the toll road becomes government property. That kind of ongoing relationship, I think, characterizes public-private partnerships in a way that when the government buys a bunch of pencils from Dixon Ticonderoga, Roga, uh, we don't have a public-private partnership. Okay. Um, so uh, that's the end of my riff on about requirements contracting. Uh, but I've got another riff, which is, isn't public-private partnership, isn't the quintessential example of what we're talking about here, uh, the uh, role of banks in the, uh, in the uh, larger um, economy? And I think that uh, banking is a very good way of thinking about what public-private partnerships are all about. And it's because what banks do is they provide a public service. 
access to finance that the government wants banks to provide, uh, and yet they are, uh, in most cases and in most countries, and certainly in this one, uh, private sector entities. Um, and so uh, uh, um, that's maybe one way of thinking about uh, what public-private partnerships are all about. Is there some sort of public service being provided by the private sector? Um, and if you do have that kind of thing, which I think you have in banking, and also maybe with utilities who are providing water and electricity um, and that sort of thing, uh, is you have this sort of ongoing relationship that we've talked about. You have the government on the hook at the end of the process. Uh, if banks go bust, then governments have to bail them out or figure out a way to fail them in a way that isn't too disruptive to the larger economy. Uh, and, and secondly, um, uh, uh, you have some of the features in public-private partnerships that you get in financial regulation. So for example, the charter, the moment where you create the thing, the private sector entity that's going to perform this public service, is important because of the ongoing relationship and the fact that when you've given that charter, you've left the government on the hook for um, uh, uh, what happens if this private sector entity fails in its effort to provide this sort of public service, this thing the government wants you to have. Secondly, you have a different kind of relationship than command and control regulation. You've got this ongoing supervisory relationship where the government's, because it's invested in what the private sector is doing, is sort of keeping tabs on what the private sector is doing in some sort of ongoing way that makes for a close relationship between bureaucrat and um, a, a corporate official uh, that's just different than um, is in other sectors of the economy. Um, and so uh, the final thing I'll say about this is, you know, Gus talked about the, the public spirit and we feeling. I don't have too much to say about this, but, you know, sometimes when you think about, you know, what do banks do when, when they talk about, you know, their commitment to whatever, the United States or making sure that people have homes or that kind of thing, you know, is this, is this sort of a, the we feeling that Gus is talking about is important or is this just kind of marketing? Uh, we've got this great government grant, we've got this charter and this business opportunity, and to keep it going, uh, we need good PR. Um, and so um, I guess uh, uh, that might be something to think about. Okay, second, so I got through one of my four points uh, in 12 minutes, um, so um, <laughs> we got three minutes for the other three, um, a minute each. Okay, is AT&T so unique? So I think AT&T is a great and evocative example of a public-private partnership. I want to suggest that um, AT&T is, rather than being sort of unique and maybe somewhat unique in the American context, super typical of many kinds of models of economic development. So for example, I think of the first English ch uh, chartered companies, which were supposed to go out there and sort of explore the world and bring back traded goods to the kingdom. Um, and they had a royal monopoly on where they could trade. And the whole idea was to increase economic prosperity by delegating some sort of potentially public service, let's go invade India, uh, to a private sector company um, that would then provide public goods back in the place. So um, AT&T is just like the East India Company. Or what about Japan Inc.? <laughs> Japan Inc., right? Um, uh, there's this model after World War II of, you know, let's create a bunch of national champion businesses that are putatively private but work hand in hand with the government. Um, and uh, let's uh, build them up by um, sort of oppressing domestic consumers and forcing them to pay high prices um, and um, uh, winning um, uh, uh, foreign consumers with exports um, and growing our economy that way. That seems like a public private partnership. Um, and so I don't think AT&T is so unique. Um, uh, there's natural monopolies all over the place. And then there's this idea that maybe you can build economic prosperity um, by creating a bunch of private sector entities and telling them to go forth and do public spirited things. So that's why I think, and this is my third point, in some ways command and control regulation can look healthier than public-private partnership style governance. Because command and control regulation lets the um, uh, private sector do what it wants to do and then swings into action when externalities are created by that private sector activity. So rather than government direction, Japan Inc., the East India Company, and AT&T, what you would get in environmental regulation is private sector um, private sector-led initiatives that the government then tries to uh, regulate uh, when the private sector initiatives uh, impose externalities um, that the private sector efforts like polluters and, you know, whatever, um, energy providers, uh, you name it, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't fully um, uh, account for. So um, 
Uh, so, you know, a, a lot of people talk about how bad it is to do, go by regulation, and isn't it better to have a public-private partnership out there um, uh, uh, where the private sector is doing its thing and, um, you know, isn't uh, handcuffed by governance and bureaucrats and pedophagy and that kind of thing. But I'm not so sure that that's always the case. In fact, I think that it's possible that uh, traditional rulemaking and adjudication style supervision of the private sector is indicative of a healthy, independent, uh, and creative private sector, and that a public-private partnership may be sort of this sort of economic development model that we saw in the East India Company, Japan Inc., and maybe the American example of AT&T. Okay, final thing. I disagree about cybersecurity. Okay, um, uh, so this isn't exactly like a, a you know, stem winder of a finish. But, um, uh, you know, uh, Gus says cybersecurity might be an example of where, like, the government is sort of a convener and can get private sector entities together. And I say no. Cybersecurity is an example of national security. There is no example, circa, I bet I can be corrected on this, of a country that's like, you know what, let's just contract out our army. Instead, countries are like, yeah, actually, the public sector is the best sector to build uh, some sort of uh, uh, its national defense apparatus. And what is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is a kind and variant of national defense. Um, and so um, it could be that the cybersecurity is not a public-private partnership kind of thing, but rather a place where the government is appropriately taking national interests into account and directing, in a command and control way, the private sector to comply with it. Um, so the public service in cybersecurity, I think, lies with the government. And I think we see, um, Gus says that, uh, you know, the private, there's lots of smart computer programmers out there in the private sector. But, you know, when it comes to, like, uh, defeating Stuxnet and stuff like that, I think the government is the best um, uh, 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 and most effective and most adept um, a practitioner of those sorts of dark arts and the defense against them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that cybersecurity is an example of the thing that you um, uh, see when, you know, people are like, let's privatize the Navy. No, we don't privatize the Navy because, uh, you know, the government's the best at knowing how to do national defense and private sector uh, individuals can't or won't do the same thing. So cybersecurity, boo. It's not a public-private partnership. Um, uh, but uh, I think that um, really, uh, Gus has given us a lot to think about. It's a very interesting story. And um, as you can tell, I had a lot to think about. So hopefully my riffs somewhat um, uh, made some sense, but they were in the manner of riffing because I think uh, this is an interesting project and well worth thinking about going forward. Thank you. Gus, I feel honor bound to give you an opportunity to respond to anything uh, of David's provocations that you think uh, compel an immediate response. You're wrong. No. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, very, very helpful, very thoughtful. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the uh, really generous engagement. Um, uh, I will start with a, a brief thing. I will not turn this into a rant about cybersecurity. Uh, you are completely right on a portion of the cybersecurity uh, universe, uh, uh, other parts of the cybersecurity universe, uh, the uh, uh, um, common vulnerability scoring system uh, uh, sort of uh, entities, uh, uh, ISACs, local law enforcement, uh, vulnerability uh, uh, and threat uh, dis information disclosure. Uh, that's a different, not solely uh, national security uh, sort of environment, uh, but that's not the part, point of the paper. So we can take that fight offline. <laughs> um, uh, I love the idea um, that uh, your penultimate idea uh, and discussion um, that we can think of uh, command and control regulation through the traditional rulemaking and adjudicatory model as uh, this isn't how you phrase it, but how uh, uh, I started thinking about it. It's kind of a way of backing into a public-private partnership model. Let industry lead the initiative, lead the development um, of uh, uh, new fields, and then uh, uh, have regulators start regulating uh, in an incremental sort of way. Uh, and I, uh, I definitely am going to incorporate some of that discussion uh, into the paper. I think that's a very interesting model. And it goes to, I think, uh, some of my framing concerns. Um, about uh, 
the approach that the regulators bring to what they're doing, and also uh, the approach that the industry brings to how they're going to interface with regulators. Um, if the regulators come in as uh, the, the cops on the beat and they're there to make a splash, I think that that's uh, uh, a bad recipe to building uh, a partnership model. Um, but if they come in instead saying, yes, this is a joke, we're from the government and we're here to help, um, uh, that might uh, uh, provide for a different sort of uh, relationship uh, that could be developed. Um, and part of the issue there um, is, uh, and I think this is one of the things that we see with the tech industry, um, we kind of have regulators that map onto the tech industry, but we also don't. The, the FTC has really tried to step in and be uh, the main tech regulator, and their authorities aren't well suited to, or don't well map onto uh, the concerns. So they've uh, been trying to force square pegs into round holes. And I wonder whether uh, uh, there's an administrative law story and a, a congressional oversight story um, uh, to think about here uh, and concern about uh, letting the regulators dictate the terms of their authority and try to address problems like this. And I am uh, uh, not going to go off on one of my uh, major questions doctrine uh, rants, other than saying perhaps if we have a major questions doctrine, uh, that could force development of uh, better uh, relationships here. Uh, and I, I agree completely that uh, AT&T isn't sweet generous. Uh, um, I think at least three times every day about AT&T, so that's why I happen to focus on it. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there certainly are other stories there. Uh, one of the reasons I like the AT&T story is I think AT&T is far richer an example than most uh, the way that we usually discuss it um, uh, gives it credit for. Well, there are pl plenty of things I could throw in here, but you have about, oh, we start a little late, so about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I will open the floor. Chuck, Mooney. Well, assuming the role of the skunk at the picnic, I just wanted to mention a public-private partnership in this area I'm familiar with, which I think presents a little different picture. And that's the Wyoming legislature and executive and their attempts to attract digital assets, virtual currencies, and the like to the state. And I mean, the level of these, the level of incompetence, ignorance, and untruthfulness on the part of these people is just stunning. So there are paradigms other than thinking about the SEC that we can think about, which are pretty poor examples of, of a public-private partnership that could actually do some good, just personal. I'll just 100% agree. I, the uh, uh, turn in uh, the public perception of public-private partnerships over the last 10-15 uh, years has been quite negative, uh, and it's uh, largely because a lot of harebrained ideas and uh, too much privatization or this is a cost-cutting way. Uh, uh, David spoke about several of these uh, problems as well. Um, so I, I do not intend to present a uh, public-private partnerships are necessarily inherently good. I think there are lessons that we can learn from them. Kathy. Yeah, so just a sort of half-baked idea, and I'm curious to know what both of you would think about this, is because as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking that maybe one way, one way to think about where command control regulation versus where positive, where public-private partnerships has to do with the distinction between whether we're trying to deal with negative externalities of the private behavior or positive externalities. So at, on the one, it's sort of like on the very like far end of, pub, of private externality, of public, positive externalities, we have sort of things that are just really public goods and the government should just do it, right? And then on the far end of negative externalities, we have stuff like environmental regulation where we just, we know the private entity is not going to do it unless we force it to because they're imposing negative externalities. Is it possible to think of where we might want to have these public-private partnerships as being sort of an area where we want more, we want to produce positive externalities, but we don't think we need the government to completely be in charge of it because there is enough, there is some incentive for the private uh, sector behavior. So I don't know, is that crazy or is, does that fit onto some of the things? So my immediate response, it's definitely not crazy, it's definitely interesting. Um, my immediate uh, response is, is the 
underlying concern, one of expertise. Who's in the better position to uh, differentiate between the positive and negative uses of the technology or sources of the externalities? And uh, this is uh, I, focusing on the, the tech sector. This is the content moderation discussion. Do we outlaw disinformation? We can't do that. Instead, we need to have uh, we need to have. I'm not endorsing this as a, a position. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, filtering that the companies themselves develop. Or perhaps the companies can't do it, it needs to be the users that do that, uh, determine and evaluate information. Where do we allocate that burden? Um, and how do we facilitate whomever is in the best position to do that, to do that? Um, there could be a partnership model to that. It could be a command and control regulation uh, approach. It, there are lots of different approaches. But I think that uh, one of the things public-private partnerships focus on is who's in the best position to do this. At the same time, if it's merely uh, uh, allocating burdens, that, isn't, uh, uh, th that doesn't need to be thought of as a public-private partnership. So I think uh, uh, it's a, a useful uh, thing for me to think about. Um, I'm not sure uh, how much traction uh, will come from it, but I definitely want to think about that. Do you think of safe harbor uh, style regulation as public-private partnership? or Because I think of that more in the regulation, it's like regulatory design. Yeah, I think of that as regulatory design. So that's another, or safe harbors, or that, that kind of thing, which is very common in, in environmental regulation. That's a sort of way, another way of dealing with the expertise issue, mm -hmm. but still kind of leaving the, stop making those next negative externalities as the, you know, kind of. So to needlessly use a uh, word, complexify, um, to complexify the discussion, uh, I, uh, uh, we might hear from Hillary some interesting ideas along this front. Uh, uh, um, regulatory experimentation, creating uh, in a more dynamic setting uh, safe harbors for experimentation, uh, that could be more partnership-like. Um, if the regulators say to industry, hey, go try these three or four different things and report back to us, we're going to give you some waivers or some forbearance or some sandboxes um, uh, to do this, uh, that could be done in partnership. Uh, so perhaps uh, that does bring us into that realm. I think that uh, um, thinking about the negative externality and positive externality thing is really interesting. Um, and it works pretty well for like banking regulation versus environmental regulation, it seems to me, where you know we want banks. Um, and um, so the government encourages them and supervises them. And we don't want polluters. And so the government uh, stamps it out. Uh, the things I wonder about, like, I mean, this doesn't have to be a problem. Like, what about like, sort of capital markets regulation or something else that the FCC does, like allocate spectrum? There, the sort of government is trying to sort of provide rules of the road and avoid, like, some, you know, um, uh, unregulated market where bad things happen or whatever, um, but isn't sort of engaged in positive externality. It's, you know, we want capital markets and we want um, spectrum allocation or we want, uh, you know, telecommunications innovation or whatever. Um, but it's not sort of, I don't know how that fits into that positive versus negative externality, if that, if that makes any sense. That, the, that kind of regulatory. Um, is that risk? Is the negative externality thing? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, you want credit provided and you want to stop them from providing credit in some way that's, uh, you know, systemically risky that could harm the economy. But, but the thing that's raised by your question, Kathy, is so if we have a positive externality, not, it's something the government may need to address, but why this form? Mm -hmm. The obvious answer is a direct subsidy or something like that and just get out. And so there seems to be an inviting us to think among, and that's what I like about the way this conference and the topics have done, is we have to think not just, oh, we have a problem. Of the many tools at our disposal, which ones are we going to use and how can we intelligently design them? That's a really interesting exercise. Janet, and then Tom. I'm wondering if another distinction between the command and control and the partnership model has to do with um, a kind of reactive response to what might be seen as a one-time problem versus an ongoing or proactive thing. And I think about, you know, how many times has Mark Zuckerberg come to Congress and said, <laughs> like, like this is, you know, something unexpected. Clearly it's an ongoing problem and a kind of one-time whack-a-mole thing isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to work with that. Um, and I think of standards as an area of public-private partnership, where there's a lot of technical standards that are done you know, collaboratively between the government and you know, between this and, and industry, um, and that you know that's a model that sort of resolves some issues of 
competing standards and, and provide stability. Um, it can also be done through procurement, but that could also be maybe a model for things like um, you know, cybersecurity in the private sector, where right now there's not a lot of incentive to provide good security. There's not sort of the appropriate liability or accountability, and people just try to cover it up. Um, you know, so maybe standards for cybersecurity that are kind of enforced in some regulatory way could be one type of area uh, where partnerships would work better than a kind of individual reactive thing. So I just wondering how you thought about that. I take it that's sort of government, a public-private partnership more is not a inv government investment, but sort of a government standardization or convening to, you know, create common standards, even if it's industry-driven or whatever. Um, yeah. So this isn't uh, a response directly to that, but uh, uh, a thinking out loud as I'm rewriting the paper in real time. Um, and right now the framing of the paper is uh, uh, regulation is partnership. Um, and um, my next rewrite is going to be regulation as relationship, and it's going to explore the command and control approach versus the partnership approach in different forms of uh, uh, ongoing relationship or one-time relationship, I think, um, uh, as a, a more compelling, I think, uh, 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 menu of things to look at. But the, there's, and as you probably know, standard setting, the role of government standard setting, there's a literature that's not, that's quite mixed. You know, and what we really have to think about is the private actors, um, is we need to endogenize the decision about whether we characterize it as a relationship or not. Mm -hmm. And I think about the, the international law literature on regime change, where sometimes we do multilateralism, sometimes we do regionalism, sometimes we do bilateralism, and sometimes it's unilateralism. And, and in a distributed action world, you expect people to act whatever is in their special best interest, their particular best interest, and see how they aggregate. And it's a really... Standard setting is a great example of why that can work out in very complicated ways. And there's actually, we assign standard setting stuff to the class, looking at examples of Europe's choice of a single standard in GSM for cell phones, while well, the U.S. allows standards competition and all these different dynamics that the national reaches. So it's quite interesting. Tom. I just want to complain about David's cyber example, <laughs> because I think it is an area where there's a lot of private action, and in fact, because people don't trust governments because they snoop into us. There might actually be a role for the private sector to be able to do some internet security that you wouldn't trust the government to do. Yeah, I mean, so uh, this is the sort of Apple, uh, you know, um, uh, do they have to cooperate with, uh, you know, criminal investigators or do they have to build a backdoor or will the government always ask for a backdoor when they really shouldn't and thereby threaten our privacy? Um, uh, so there may be something to that, but I still say that, um, you know, when it comes to protecting information, uh, the people who are best and have thought the longest and have done the most uh, work in sort of ferreting out information and in uh, keeping information quiet, those are government actors. Uh, that's, you know, uh, snoops at the CIA and in the, you know, whatever, intelligence community or whatever. And... Um, I'm not sure that the private sector is going to have the sort of incentives or the capacity for that matter to uh, match government expertise. Um, so maybe I'm looking at uh, cybersecurity too narrowly, but that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from. I, I take the point, totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just to plug something else that we're doing, it's, it's interesting. Um, there are areas where it's entirely private. David Wichnick and I are doing an NSF grant on a, a security, privately deployed security technology that's just not rolling out. Uh -huh. And it raises the interesting question, is the example of what Tom and Gus are talking about, it's purely private. It's whether ISPs deploy it. There's, on the other hand, we're finding obstacles for it rolling out that have to do with collective action problems. Mm -hmm. Problems that may invite governmental intervention to, to solve. That's a classic thing that governments solve. And mm -hmm. so, we have to you know, get inside these to understand exactly how much of it is public and how much of it is private in the end in terms of solutions. So I guess I want to I throw something at both of you, that something you said that, evo that evoked things out of my thoughts, which is, um, so you're asking, Gus, you're asking us if it's um, uh, adversarial or cooperative. And the answer I keep thinking is, well, it's both. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a game where you're trying to maximize the value by arranging the resources, but then it's backed up by a claiming game where once you've created the value, you try to you know, distribute it. Mm -hmm. Our normal solutions are iterating the game, relational contracting or repeat play, mm 
with, as you point out, see Ostrom blocking exit, because you, if you do that, all that unravels. And it's a way, and, but we also know that not all games are incentive compatible this way. We tend to always think of things in the prisoner's dilemma. There's also games of chicken, where if you have different payoffs, it's win-lose. And so I find myself wondering if there's a lens to understand that the partnership locks them in in the relationship, so it looks, works against exit, but it has to be chosen in ways the payoffs are right. David, your example of project finance makes me think of the basic, the primary problem in project finance is expropriation by the government, you know, nationalization. And the problem is you cannot stop the government. Um, you know, it just, and is public-private partnerships a way to solve or to put skin in the game on the government side to at least reduce, you can't take their ability away because they can always expropriate property. Is it a way, is, can it be explained as an attempt to change the incentives to do so? So I'll uh, start responding to the first part. Um, I, I think that that's definitely right. And the uh, game theory uh, model, certainly the relational model is very important here. And uh, uh, it, it's a, a setting where the, uh, uh, to riff on the, the famous uh, quote, the only way to win is to make sure the other guy has to play too. Um, uh, the, one of the challenges here though, uh, and David uh, did a great job I think of highlighting this, is the government has to play in this game. So if the government can't exit, uh, that changes the strategic dynamics for private industry a great deal. They can choose uh, not to get involved in the game at all if they're not going to, uh, if they don't think they're going to win uh, uh, in the end, or they can uh, structure their payouts uh, so that when the government would want to exit but can't, they can arbitrage that to their benefit. So uh, I, I think the uh, nuance in uh, the um, uh, game theoretic model is uh, it's the public choice element. It's the uh, relationship between the uh, private interests and their ability to uh, manipulate or play into the uh, incentives of the public actors, and in this case, their uh, inability to exit. I think that's, uh, that's really interesting to think about project finance, a public-private partnership as reducing the risk of expropriation by making the government a sort of uh, participant in the project, and so therefore committed in uh, its development. Of course, it could still want to expropriate if, uh, you know, it's a 20% participant and then the thing get built and it's like, actually, now I'd like to be a 100% participant. Um, uh, so this is just riffing, but, um, you know, one of the things I think that's um, interesting about project finance is it's an effort to solve uh, problems of risk by, um, you know, uh, contracting. Um, and, uh, you know, and if uh, those contracts aren't going to be honored, if the non-recourse contract doesn't work, then the whole model of project finance doesn't really work. So um, you have to have um, contracts honored uh, to make project financing work. Um, and uh, of course, if the government expropriates property, then it's not, it's not doing that. So, um, so it's interesting. Well, we, you got it, Raj, last word. <laughs> I've been sitting here puzzling about your choice of the word adversarial. Mm -hmm. Because uh, first of all, common carry regulation prior to the 1970s Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I recommend Paul Joskow's 1974 paper, Inflation and Environmental Concern, as it identifying when it switched mm -hmm. from being collaborative to being adversarial. You could all, there's also another reference, which is Steve Kelman's PhD dissertation, Regulating America, Regulating Sweden, which is all about how Europe has more like a collaborative relationship than an adversarial. Mm -hmm. But the, the main point is this. <laughs> to go into another area of my uh, I've sunk time, football stadiums. <laughs> there hasn't been a subsidized football stadium built in the United States in 25 years that didn't lead to lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, the city of Santa Clara and the San Francisco 49ers are engaged in six lawsuits against each other. <laughs> All right. It took exactly nine months between the opening of the football stadium and the first lawsuit. Mm -hmm. All right. So, point of this is public-private partnerships probably lead to litigation mm -hmm. between the parties at least as frequently as common carrier regulation. Yeah. And the really interesting question is why? Mm -hmm. All right. And 
I suspect that that this feeds into your story, mm -hmm. right? And that adversarialness becomes endogenous to the degree to which and there's asymmetric information and the propensity for getting sleeves, you know, mm -hmm. sleeves. All right. And so the, it means there's a certain informational requirement on the part of the government that has to be satisfied in order for these things not to be catastrophic. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, and um, as I ended um, saying, I, I've been looking at the um, ACUS reports and thinking more and more of the Zostrom. One of the things that uh, the uh, ACUS uh, uh, identified in the early 1980s for a P3 to a public private partnership to work is uh, uh, rough uh, informational parity. And that's also something that uh, uh, Ostrom uh, uh, discusses as important um, in uh, uh, governance models. Um, I'll, I'll add to what you're saying. I, I don't know if uh, Carrie is here. Um, in the 1980s, uh, we started experimenting with or trying something called uh, a negotiated rulemaking, where industry would work with regulators to design the rules. And uh, everyone thought this is going to be a great kumbaya sort of uh, less uh, the rules will be better, uh, they'll be more seamless, they'll be more quickly developed, uh, there will be less litigation because everyone's on board. Um, and in fact, what we found was more litigation ensued more rapidly um, uh, as a result. Um, so a similar dynamic in a, a different setting uh, where I expect a, a lot of the same uh, concerns were at play. Thank you, Camilla. Well, um, I'll encourage you to have that conversation with the off I'm just, I'm going to talk about it later anyway. Okay, great. <laughs> well, on that note, since we're standing between us and lunch, please join me in thanking David and Gus for a fabulous <laughs>